Good morning, everyone. Today we will uh, see more deeply the slower is faster effect. Uh, we mentioned this already in one of the first classes, uh, but it was just briefly, so let's get into it. So you, you can find more details in the, the paper published with Dirk Kelvin. So the, this is way to explain slower is faster effect is with port, perhaps. And just see where is everyone. <laughs> Zoom likes to hide screens. Um, yeah, so is the oh, but I didn't share the audio, so let me stop sharing. And let me share So, this is the two thousand and eight. For Bonner and Tilvarandra, we'll see in championships in in Rome. Final of 100 meter butterfly. In the fourth lane, there's Chavich from the Czech Republic. Is, is that the Czech Republic? Oh. Um, and Michael Phelps in lane five. In the morning, Chavich broke the world record, which was 50 seconds. Point zero one. And when we start, you can see that Chavich starts very fast. He's almost one body length in front of Phelps, or half a body length. And in the split, he's under his own world record. But say the race is. 100 meters, not 15. That red line is the world record pace. There's just a few meters left. Helps accelerate. Break the world record. That record stood for, I don't know, more than 10 years. First, first time someone swam under 50 seconds, um, 100 meter butterfly. Yeah. So, of course, one can say, how can you swim faster? I mean, we, we, you notice that I like swimming, but I mean, this applies to, to any race. Um, so how to, to do a fast race, independently of whether it's running or cycling or whatever uh, if you start too fast you will get tired and then you will burn out uh, but if you start too slow then you won't be able to, to do uh, such a good time so how to find the, the best possible pace and in many cases uh, yes yeah, unless it's a sprint if you open as fast as you can that's not the best strategy so you can go faster by going slower uh, which is basically how fast and how slow it depends on how long is the distance. Um, of course, on each athlete, because uh, different people can withstand different speeds, um, more or less. Um, so, I mean, this is like something that people know when they do sports. It's, it's not like something new or out of the ordinary, uh, but, Let's say the the slower is faster effect as a phenomenon began. Uh, I mean, was first described uh, a bit more than thirty years ago, studying um, crowd dynamics. So uh, f f first, this phenomenon was coined uh, with the term freezing by heating, because the models of um, pedestrians that were used, uh, let's say, nineteen ninety nine, two thousand. Um, 
uh, well, there's this social force model, which was developed mainly by Dirk. By Dirk. Uh, the, it's inspired by thermodynamics, so the, the, it's similar to the model of a, a gas, and each gas particle, it's a person. And then depending on how much it moves, um, let's say it, that can indicate how stressed or nervous or shaky that person is. And what, what they found is that if people are, let's say, in panic, trying to evacuate the room, then what, they try to go out fast, but they will actually go out slow. And I think we already saw this video. But anyway, that kind of illustrates this effect very clearly. So on the left side, there is people going out calmly. So yeah, in Mexico City, we just had an earthquake, uh, what, a bit more than an hour ago. So if you heard the alarm uh, and were evacuating, like on the left side, you, you don't scream, you don't push, you don't run, uh, and you go out faster uh, compared to the right side where it's every man for himself. What's, what would be the politically correct version of that phrase? Every person for herself, um, for themselves, yeah. <laughs> every person for themselves. So, there's an analogy between turbulent flow and laminar flow. So laminar flow, you, you don't have turbulence, of course. And, and then the uh, turbulence interrupts the flow. Uh, so you get it when you try to go faster, but then the turbulence makes it slower. And um, the same happens with ship. Um, so and on the left side, they are less pushy because it's less cold. On the right hand, they are pushier, it's colder, and they enter their pen slower. Um, and of course, this can be useful for airplane evacuation. This is a test which was made on the Airbus uh, 318. Uh, so, okay, according to the um, IATA, in order to, to have license to fly, an airplane must be evacuated in, I don't know, 90 seconds? I, we will see now. So, so they were kind of showing that it's possible to evacuate more than 500 people in a uh, plane in, in a minute and a half. Um, and th there's an early work uh, where people found that there is like a critical width of the door of the airplane where if it's shorter then you will have slower is faster effect and if it's broader then it doesn't matter whether people are panicked or not the faster you go out the best um, what happens is that uh, or maybe it was 120 to, to evacuate the yeah, so they, they managed to, that's why they're so happy. <laughs> uh, so the, the thing is that um, in an airplane, the seats kind of serve as a buffer, so people in the corridor cannot push the people who are at the door. So I hope you never have to evacuate a plane, but if you do, uh, the best strategy is just to get out as fast as you can. Uh, no, no need for courtesy. Yeah, there, there is a, an anecdote that in the Titanic, uh, like there were less British, less percentage of British males survived as opposed to Americans. And some people say that it's because the, the British were better educated and say, no, no, please, after you women and children first, and the Americans kind of lost all civility. I, I don't know whether that's true, that's one, one way of. Uh, professor, yes. Uh, have you seen the movie Captain Phillips with uh, Tom Hanks? 
in that yeah. movie they uh, there's a scene where they evacuate people from a plane and something interesting is that usually people try to to get their their luggage yes so that uh, slowers the evacuation and well maybe this this video that you show that you are showing here doesn't uh, do that it's just people is uh, coming out without their luggage Yes, yes. Here, here, everyone is following orders. If if people start to take their luggage or don't take off their shoes or just panic in the middle of the corridor and cannot move forward or backward, of course, that affects everyone. Yeah. Okay. So it, it turns out that the slower is faster effect is also present in mixed traffic with pe pedestrians and, and cars. So also in the group of Dirk Helbing, they, they made um, a simulation where there was a pedestrian crossing and then there was a situation with uh, fast pedestrians or let's say impatient pedestrians who as long as there was uh, a gap in the cars, they would cross, but then that would slow the cars. Uh, uh, and that slowdown of the cars would um, make that there would be less windows for pedestrians to cross. So actually the pedestrians had to wait more as opposed to a regime where let's say there was like a traffic light and then lots of cars can cross and then lots of pedestrians can cross. So the average waiting times were higher and people were less patient. Uh, so it's just another example of this effect. And it, for the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise round at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track. So the jam spread backwards around the track like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real life jams move backwards at about the same speed. So, so this is well known for highway traffic that depending on the density and on the speed that cars uh, try to go, uh, let's say as you increase the density, there are suddenly a phase transition where let's say cars need to start braking. And this is analogous to the transition between laminar flow and turbulent flow. And here the turbulence is basically the jammed phase uh, where, where you have cars stopping and going and simply, let's say, because of random changes in speed or overreactions while braking, let's say a car reduces the speed and then the car behind reduces the speed and then the car behind reduces the speed. And of course, this is for a density where you already have several cars and then that forms a traffic jam and sometimes the cars uh, have to stop completely. And then this traffic jam moves in the opposite direction of the cars. Uh, so, so this is more or less well understood. And um, also, it, it depends on the speeds. So for example, if cars try to go as, at 120 kilometers an hour, you have a capacity of more or less six or seven vehicles per kilometer lane. Uh, because of the safety distance, which is given not in meters, but in time. So you, you need about two seconds between vehicles to, to have a, to be able to break. Um, and uh, if, if you have more, more vehicles than those, then you will have a traffic jam. However, if you reduce the speed, so for example, let's say you know, 60 kilometers an hour, then you have the double capacity for laminar flow before you go into the phase transition. And like this, you can uh, maximize flow by adjusting the speed of the cars. And uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, I experienced this in a uh, freeway close to Venice uh, in the Italian mainland that they had sensors and dynamic speed limits. Uh, so they would detect how many cars were on a segment of the road. And then depending on that, they would start changing the, the speed limit. Uh, problem is that nobody respected the speed limit, so it was the, the human factor uh, was, was problematic, um, as always. <laughs>
But um, I mean, understanding this gives us insight because if you try to maximize flow for a given density, then you basically want to go close to the phase transition, but not to go after. Because also there's some hysteresis in the sense that if, uh, let's say, during the, the rush hour, there's an increase in density, and then let's say you have an increasing flow, and then the flow decreases because you have traffic jumps, and then the density decreases, but already the organization of the vehicles is such that the flow doesn't increase uh, as it's decreased. It uh, remains very low. And only when it's way back on the laminar uh, flow phase, uh, it can grow again. So yeah, that, that's another property of, of traffic. So, so you really don't want to, to go into the jump phase because not only it reduces your current flow, but it will make it difficult to get back to laminar flow uh, because of hysteresis. So in, in self-organizing traffic lights that we, we have developed, um, for low densities, you can have, uh, let's say, one, one vehicle even triggering a, a green light. Um, and as you add more vehicles, then the switching becomes faster and faster. But if you have uh, let's say you, you don't need many vehicles, but just a few vehicles, then the traffic lights start switching constantly. And that's less efficient than many other methods for, for traffic light coordination. So um, a better alternative is to, to have uh, the formation of platoons. And in this way, the vehicles wait for longer at one traffic light, but uh, by waiting, they promote the formation of platoons. And once they're platoons, then they can flow through, through the city uh, almost without stopping the, because they trigger the traffic lights before they reach the intersection and they will stop only if there's another platoon crossing. So you can also explain that with the slower is faster effect. In logistics and supply chains, uh, people have also, uh, found uh, slower is faster fix. So, for example, in uh, I think it was in the port of Hamburg, uh, they had some automated guided vehicles. Uh, but let's say if they kind of run into each other, one needs to stop and then they need to decide who goes first, and that slows everything. Um, so, they were going at a certain speed and they were stopping, and let's say they had some uh, operation performance. But then they lowered the speed of the vehicles and that made it less probable that they would stop because let's say they yeah, have to keep such a large safety distance. And the result was that everything was faster. Uh, of course, if you make it too slow, then it's worse. So you, you need to, uh, to explore uh, the parameter space to, to be able to maximize the performance. And similarly, in semiconductor production, um, there, there was a bottleneck. And then if you try to run everything at full speed, that bottleneck created huge delays. And then if they slow down the production, then that bottleneck was not overwhelmed. And then everything flowed faster uh, in the production. Uh, and similarly, in a packaging plant. So if you, if you try to, to go as fast as possible, in many cases, it's not the best solution. And actually, it can be counterproductive in many cases. So, again, public transport. Similar effect. People want to get in at all costs, then the economics collapse. So if, if you let the... Uh, in many cases, um, I mean, well, there's this equal headway instability. So um, if, if you have, um, maybe you have seen it, that you are waiting for the Puma bus or the Metro bus or the Metro, and you wait, 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 wait. And there is one vehicle coming, which is full, but there are three more behind, which are almost empty. 
So the, the Russian explanation for this is that they were the drivers were playing domino and then they finished and then they began working all together. But there's a more plausible explanation. And, and is that if if one vehicle gets delayed, then let's say the others uh, catch up and then in the next station, let's say it will be the, the delay will be increased because of a positive feedback because there will be more people at the platform or at the station waiting for for the vehicle and even if you allow passing like with um with buses in mexico city they, they still all bunch together this is also known as the bus bunching problem uh so i mean we have proposed algorithms to to solve this uh equal headway instability but uh, from the passenger side, you can also observe the slower is faster effect uh, because if if people try to get into the first vehicle, then they will delay it even more. And in some cases, if you let the vehicle go and take the next one, which is with more space, then the, the line will improve and you will reach your destination faster as opposed to boarding the first vehicle that came. Um, but of course you don't know <laughs> because there's no information about it. Uh, and for example, in, in Boston, in the red line, uh, when they had, when they had this, um, this problem, the equal headway stability, they had lots of trains. Uh, and then if you were in the, in the first train of the convoy, uh, the, you would reach Park Street and then the, the driver would say, reservoir. And what it means is, uh, if you are going to a station before Harbor Square, get out and <laughs> take the train behind because this will be an express train to Harbor Square. And most people didn't understand, so they would go to Harbor Square and then they have to, <laughs> to go back because the audio quality was terrible. Uh, so, so that was the way they dealt with it. Like, okay, we kind of the the train that is delayed will be express and will not stop in several stations. Uh, and the previous one will be able to take the passengers who who need service to those stations. Uh, but of course, it's better if if you don't uh, need to to solve that problem. But if you never have it, that's much better. So so that's what we proposed. And it's also another instance of the slower is faster effect because um, with a very simple algorithm inspired by and colony communication, we we have. Um, uh, each vehicle trying to keep similar distance to their neighbors. And just with that, uh, you, you, you get super optimal performance. Uh, and it's because of the slower is faster effect uh, in the sense that people wait for more time uh, than the so-called optimal method at the stations. But once they board the train, they will reach their destination faster. And uh, um, I mean, of course, the theory made some wrong assumptions and that's why you can get super optimal performance with this method which is adaptive instead of trying to predict the, the flow of passengers and then well there are many modes of opinion formation um one is the axle root model which is not realistic at all uh so you can see it as a cellular automaton like game of life so you, you have a grid and each cell is a, a voter and they can have an opinion, one or minus one, which could be, I don't know, uh, pro-abortion, anti-abortion, uh, whatever you want to decide. Um, Pro-euthanasia, anti-euthanasia. Uh, and the model is that uh, basically the each voter Change it, can change its opinion depending on the average opinion of its eight neighbors. And um, depending on how, uh, well, if you allow voters to change their opinion too fast, basically that every time steps they can change their opinion, then in some cases for some classes of initial conditions, uh, the system will never converge. So the, the, this means that people will change their opinion and that makes that other people ch will change their opinion and other people change their opinion and then the first ones will change back their opinion and it never stabilizes. Uh, however, for the same initial conditions, if you 
uh, decrease the speed of the opinion change. Uh, basically, uh, you don't change the opinion every time others change the opinion, but you wait some time and then you take the average. Uh, then it, opinion converges uh, much faster. Well, for, first of all, it converges, and, and then uh, if you adjust the parameters properly, it can converge faster. Um, and also, the, this is known from combinatorial game theory uh, that depending on how you balance exploration and exploitation, uh, you, you can find solutions faster or slower. Um, so, so for example, if you are playing chess, it's not necessarily that the best move uh, in the next step will take you to, to win. But this is like the, the analogy. So if you try to win fast, that doesn't mean that you will win. <laughs> uh, because the best move might uh, not be, let's say for, for winning the game, might not be the best immediate move that will give you the highest payoff. Um, which, I mean, we, we can see it in life, no? If, if you take uh, the highest short-term reward, probably that is not the best long-term investment. <laughs> um, and there are lots of fables about that, no? The, uh, the how called cigar in, in English? Uh, cicada and the ant that the cicada was partying all summer, having fun, uh, while the ant was working and winter came and cicada had nothing to eat. So, yeah. Uh, and I mean, about financial trading, it's with a question mark because let's say it's it makes sense that there's a slower is faster figure, but I haven't seen studies about this precisely. Um, so with automatic trading that was introduced, I don't know, maybe more than 15 years ago in, in different stock exchanges, um, th that increased the volatility a lot because uh, computer algorithms are able to buy and sell in microseconds. Uh, so there were some episodes where suddenly 10% of the uh, stock exchange in New York just vanished. I mean, the, the value decreased by 10% and then in an hour it was recovered and nobody knew why or how. Um, because the prices kind of are, are determined by the algorithms and then these algorithms are secret and you don't know what other people are using or playing. Uh, so very probably this turbulence of financial trading uh, decreases economic growth. I mean, that's, that's an open mm -hmm. question, but I, it seems plausible that that is the case. Therefore, if we want to accelerate uh, let's say economic development for the next years, very probably we need to slow down fin financial trading. And actually, after the uh, uh, crisis 2007 2008, they, I, I believe that they introduced some speed limits, <laughs> but still it seems it's too fast. Um, I mean, just the fact that it's so chaotic, uh, that should tell you that it needs to, to, to slow down much more. I don't know whether people should be allowed only one transaction per, let's say, that they program all the transactions of their day and then all of these are carried out and then you cannot make transactions until the next day um, or every hour or every week. I, I don't know, but probably some slower time scale would uh, stabilize the, the market values uh, and that would promote growth. Uh, but yeah. And, and another concept that has had been proposed but is related to, to the slower is faster effect is prudent predators. 
So if you have a predator that is so effective that it just uh, eats up all, all its uh, prey, then it will go extinct. So natural selection will favor those species that do not <laughs> finish their prey. Um, and, and actually, we can see this in with a net logo model. Yeah, I have spoken about net logo, but we, we haven't shown it, so but now can be a good time. Well, better let's let's finish the presentation and then we'll go into net logo to see some examples. So a, a similar concept. It's prudent parasites. Um, so actually, orchids are not parasites, but they are thought to be parasites in the sense that they, they do not affect the plants they live in. But there is this argument that it benefits the parasites not to kill their hosts so that they can survive. Uh, and the same applies to, to viruses. So it seems that the initial strains of AIDS were much more virulent and they were killing their hosts. Uh, therefore, there was a selection for less uh, deadly strains of AIDS. Um, and with the coronavirus, uh, now some people make the similar arguments saying that, oh, well, uh, the natural selection will help us and let's say the virulence of, of the virus will decrease because the virus benefits from people not dying, so it will be able to spread to, to more hosts. Uh, however, for coronavirus, that is not the case because um, the contagion is finished before, way before uh, the patients die. Uh, just like, I mean, Ebola was so virulent that indeed that limited its own propagation. But there are other diseases that uh, the virulence is relevant for the reproduction. So, for example, the bubonic plague, since they were spreading through the lice in rats, if I'm not mistaken, um, or, or cholera, which is spread through the water, they don't care if the host dies. Well, if, if humans die because that does not affect the reproductive cycle. And the same, uh, the coronavirus, they reproduce before uh, the, the host dies. So, so there's no selective pressure for them to, to become less virulent. And I mean, Delta was le uh, much more virulent. Omicron was less, but nothing tells us that the next variant will be less virulent than Omicron or less virulent than Delta for, for that matter. So, uh, yeah, well, one should be uh, careful about uh, these generalizations. Uh, another important uh, aspect that is related to, to the slower is faster effect is uh, resource management in general. So, fisheries is one example, but also all natural resources that um, are renewable. So you have a renewable rate, and if you extract at a rate which is greater than the renovation rate, then you will basically uh, finish your resources uh, sooner than later. Um, so in that sense, you will reach farther if you don't overfish or over harvest or over crop. Um, but of course, you don't want to uh, waste opportunity of resources that are there so for example in fisheries people make very sophisticated calculations in order to estimate what would be the maximum catch for a particular species in a particular region so that it will be sustainable well if fishing boats would follow those limits then maybe there, there would be some hope, but the, the fact is that many fisheries have been depleted because of overfishing. Uh, uh, an extreme is with whales that uh, 
in many cases they were almost extinct uh, or extinct in the case of, of the Zika. Um, so it's something that, let's say, we deal with it, we know it happens, but still uh, people try to get the short-term benefit at the cost of the long-term sustainability. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, we have spoken a lot about adaptation that at different time scales can be uh, described as evolution development of learning. Uh, and I already mentioned this balance between exploration and exploitation. And um, in adaptation in general, uh, let's say, depending on the search space and on the time scale that you are, let's say, moving, um, you, you need a balance, let's say, to adapt faster. You, of course, we want to adapt as fast as possible, but then how, how is that? Uh, uh, and we know that we need a balance between exploration and exploitation. Exploration is basically that you search for new solution. Exploitation is that you try to search for variations in the solutions that you already have, uh, or, or yet you try to improve over current solutions instead of searching new ones from scratch. Um, so, for example, let's let's say in music, uh, exploration would be when there's a new genre that pops up. So, for example, and at some point there is uh, reggaeton coming up, uh, and then it's it's a big success, and then people exploit it. So they kind of make very similar songs that fall within the genre reggaeton, reggaeton, reggaeton. Uh, uh, and it's all the same. <laughs> uh, until people get tired. I don't know whether people will ever get tired of reggaeton, but uh, well, you can always hope. And um, and then it will be time for, for exploration again. Um, so again, with many solutions, especially in non-stationary problems, um, the, the way in which you find the balance between exploration and exploitation is a, a non-trivial matter, but it's something that we have to consider. Um, and it's not trivial because it depends on the specific problem. So, so there is no general solution, but at least we know that since there is no general solution, then we need to find particular solutions for each problem. So, I mean, it's not the end of the world, it's just that uh, yeah, actually, it means that we will not get, run out of, of work. Um, so then writes, uh, thinking on evolvability, the adaptation sometimes wouldn't be a solution exploitable by exploring and unlearning. Um, yeah, I mean, if you are looking at multiple timescales in parallel, then you can combine the exploration by evolution and exploitation by, by learning. Uh, so. Yeah, you could see, I mean, it's a way of seeing it because you could say that genetic change is uh, exploration and then epigenetic change, uh, it's uh, exploitation. You know? and, and you can use that to explain the Baldwin effect, for example. But then you could also, if you focus just on the genetic level, then you can speak about exploration and exploration at that level in the sense that if you uh, kind of work with recombinations of existing genes, then that would be exploitation. And if you are searching for new genes, that would be exploration. So, I mean, it's just a matter of convenience. So, I don't know much about quantum computing, but I've been told that in adiabatic quantum computing, there's also something similar to slower is faster effect. If you evolve too fast your system, then information is lost. So in, in order to, to have preserve the quantum effects that uh, are so uh, coveted in, in quantum computing, then let's say the computing cannot go too fast. Uh, Otherwise, you will lose information. So, if we have this lower is faster effect in in so many different phenomena, uh, we did we we tried to to generalize it, and I mean we, we just made <laughs> a list of of common properties. So, 
well, yeah, all of these have multiple components, but almost everything has multiple components. Then we were wondering whether nonlinear feedbacks were uh, could be used to explain the slower is faster effect. And then there's this concept of friction that can be very general. So uh, we developed a, a model where you have like particles, and then the faster they go, the more friction there is between them. So then let's say there's a phase transition, and then that can help you explain. But um, yeah, I mean you you need a phase transition because basically before the phase transition, if you increase one variable, then you go faster. And then after the phase transition, you start going slower. Um, however, in many cases, that phase transition changes. <laughs> uh, so there, there you need adaptation. So for example, in the highway traffic, the density changes the phase transition. So you need to adapt to the current density in order to maximize flow. Um, so what we did find is that there's some necessary conditions. There should be an instability that will lead to the decrease of performance or speed, uh, then an amplification mechanism. So that's also related with feedbacks. And the, then this phase transition will take you to inefficiency. And also there's this concept of overloading that uh, seems to, to be present in, in all this uh, phenomenon. But uh, I mean, we, we, the, the initial idea when we started working on this is like, well, let, let's kind of find the general model of the slower is faster effect. And with that, we will be able to explore, uh, to explain all these particular cases. Uh, but then thinking about it, well, at first we were finding more and more examples of the slower is faster effect or phenomena, which uh, were similar to the slower is faster effect. Um, and then like trying to, to take a broader perspective, we were like, well, okay, let's think of a system that doesn't have slower is faster effect. Uh, and it seems that there isn't, which is not good for a theory because if what you're trying to explain applies to everything you observe, then it's not very useful. Um, in the sense that you, we didn't find a system where you wouldn't have a slower is faster effect because, well, because the universe is finite. In the sense that, for example, if you, uh just keep on increasing the speed of whatever uh on earth it will reach at some point that the friction with the atmosphere will vaporize that thing so uh let's say it seems that a consequence of the structure of the of our universe is that there is no variable that you can increase indefinitely without the system breaking uh, yeah, we should read a, a paper by Ashby about uh, breaking machines. Um, so, yeah, it applies to everything, but I don't think it's useless because we try to build many systems that exhibit the slower is faster effect, and we are not aware of it. So we try to push it to the limit, and then that is not the best option in many cases. Uh, in economic systems and in production systems and in social systems. Um, and if we understand better this lower faster effect, then we'll be able to manage better all, the, all of these systems. So I, I think it's it's important to, to have better understanding. So uh, before we move to net low, are, are there any questions on the slower is faster effect? So one of my teachers would say, if there are no questions, it means either that everyone understood everything or that nobody understood anything. Which one is it? Maybe the second option is, <laughs> is the thing I'm... <clears throat> so, sorry? 
Ah, uh, uh, I, I want to try to say the, la segunda opción, eh, creo que es lo que está pasando aquí. <laughs> Well, the paper is very short, so if you want to know more about it, then uh, I invite you to read it. Uh, but Lucrecia writes, is this effect considered a, as a disturbance? Uh, no, it's kind of an inherent property of systems. Um, it can be caused by per disturbances, but let's say the fact that there is this phase transition into inefficiency. Uh, it's like inherent part of the system, uh, of the behavior of the system. Um, it's, it's not necessarily that system kind of breaks down, but that it changes its function. And that function is kind of not what you wanted the system to do. So, uh, Yeah, this is more related to, to a general theory of balance that uh, I, I hope to, to develop in a book uh, next year during my sabbatical. Uh, because if, if we speak about balance, then there are examples since antiquity, Aristotle's golden mean, uh, the myth of Icarus. Um, so if you remember, his father Daedalus told him, don't go too high or the sun will burn the walks on your wings or don't go too slow or the foam of the waves will swallow you. And of course, he didn't listen and he died. But um, <laughs> the, the moral of the story was that you shouldn't go either too high or too low. Uh, and also in, in Buddhism, there's uh, the great middle way, which uh, is basically to avoid extremes. And um, I, like trying to think about this in very general terms, I, I think it's a consequence of uh, of our universe being finite uh, or, yeah, you, you cannot just increase indefinitely. So if you increase, 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 then there will be a moment where things will stop working or, or will change the way they were working. And that's not what you want. Like if you, let's say, want to maximize something, Um, people also, uh, there's also this um, concept of the Goldilocks principle. So from the, the tale of Goldilocks and the three bears, that each case there's like the soup that is too hot or too cold or just right, or the bed that is too hard or too soft or just right. Um, so. Uh, People speak about Goldilocks conditions of our planet and of our universe, actually, in the sense that if you, well, let's speak about our planet. If it was farther from the sun, then it would be too cold for life. If it was closer to the sun, it would be too hot for life. Um, the fact that there is water, that uh, temperature doesn't vary so much as opposed let's say, to the moon or or Venus or Mars, uh, then there will, there will be life. Uh, so, so these Goldilocks conditions is like just right, no? Or also many universal constants in physics. Um, people, well, some physicists have made calculations and they claim that if you move a little bit those constants, say um, Newton's constant of gravitation, Uh, Planck's constant, uh, speed of light, uh, I, I don't know how many basic constants there are in physics, there, there are a few, but if you change a bit those, then uh, not only life wouldn't be possible, but let's say like star formation wouldn't be possible and things like that. Uh, so then there's theories that try to explain how our universe got these um, constants and this known as the fine tuning problem. So how do you fine tune the, these universal constants? And one of the 
theories about this by Liz Molin and, and some somebody else uh, is that um, basically they, they use natural selection. So they say that through black holes, new universes are born and then they contain small variations on the constants on previous universes. And if they're not viable, they will not get black holes. And if they're viable, they will kind of propagate these constants. And through this evolutionary process, you will end up with universes like ours that are viable. Um, I think something akin to self-organized criticality might be uh, more possible. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, what it seems to me is that physic, in physics, there is this idea that the universe tends to high entropy. But I think that's only one part of the story. We have plenty of examples where there's a reduction in entropy, but of course, you need energy for that. So let's say throughout our universe, we see many examples where order increases or decreases depending on, on different uh, circumstances. So the, the star formation, that's a reduction in entropy, planet formation, origins of life, that all of that is a reduction of entropy. Of course, you need energy for that, and it's, it's not a closed system. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the second law of thermodynamics is not violated. Um, but between these two opposing forces, uh, one increasing organization and the other decreasing it, then you have a balance and say that should take you to so-called cold lock conditions. Uh, but yeah. I have a question about entropy. So for example, a TV with statics, that's full entropy, that's noise. Right, and and what would yeah. be the contrary of entropy, like a blank screen, like a white screen or a black screen, that would be completely yeah. or okay. of, of just one color, yeah, or just one color. So yeah, because for me, life is that thing that happens between a blank, yes. a blank screen, a, a completely chaotic one. Yes. So let's say Boltzmann gives entropy, which is equivalent to Shannon's information, uh, is maximized when you have equal probability of being in all states. So if you have, let's say, white noise, then you have equal probability that a pixel will be white or black. So that's maximum entropy. And minimum entropy is when you have absolute certainty of what will be the state of a bit or uh, state of a system. Uh, and if you know that it's black, then you know everyone is black, then entropy is zero. Uh, and that would be maximum organization as well. Uh, so, so then there is this balance between entropy and organization that uh, say leads to criticality. And that's why people say that life and computation is critical, or another term not so popular is uh, the age of chaos. Uh, because you need to be able to adapt uh, and you need change for that. But if you change too much, basically you have too much entropy, you lose information that you had already. Um, but if you are completely organized, then there's no change, no adaptation possible. So you, you need a balance between those two. And, and that balance will be dynamic and it will depend on the interactions that, or, or the environment that uh, each system will be in. But uh, I, yeah, that, that's something many of us are working on. Okay, so let's start with natural one. So in, in Logo, perhaps the, the easiest way of starting is with the models library. So I, I think you cannot see the <laughs> my window of models library, but if you go to 
five models library, then you, you will see that uh, there are lots of categories of sample models, art, biology, chemistry and physics, computer science, earth science, games, mathematics, networks, philosophy, psychology, social science, system dynamics. So for example, in biology, there are <coughs> many, many uh, examples. And I will open one which is called wolf sheep predation. So usually the way to play with this, you press set up and then go. And here you have a sheep, and wolves that eat sheep, and grass that is eaten by sheep. So we'll just see what, what happens each. Uh, well, these are called agents because they act on their environment. So the wolves perceive whether there are sheep around them, and they eat them if they find them. If not, they just move and keep on searching. Um, and they have kind of a constant expenditure of energy. If that energy reaches zero, they die. If they eat, then it increases. I think if they reach a certain point, they reproduce. Uh, so it's kind of very easy to explain what, what are the rules of this system. So if, if we start, we see that suddenly there are lots of sheep. And then when there are lots of sheep, then that promotes the formation of lots of wolves. And then when there are lots of wolves, they almost finish all the sheep. And then the wolves starve, and then there are lots of sheep. And this is because <laughs> sheep have inherited the earth. Um, but this is because the, the grass is infinite. So let's uh, put some finite resources. So let's say it's, it's the same parameters, but now the grass takes some time to to regrow, let's say it's 30 uh, time steps. And in population dynamics, there, there's these Lotka Volteri equations which describe this type of interactions. You have one variable but, uh, for each species, and then you have uh, constants, and it is known that you can have chaotic dynamics with these equations. Uh, but it's much easier to, to understand with, with agent-based models. So there are some oscillations, but more or less, let's say the wolves survive and the sheep survive. Uh, and they have good seasons, bad seasons. Uh, and, and you can see the feedbacks. If, if the, there are too many sheep, then that promotes the reproduction of wolves. If there are too many wolves, they eat too many sheep, then the sheep go down, then the wolves go down. Uh, so, it depends on different parameters, like how much energy the wolves get from the sheep or how easy they reproduce. Um, and then depending on this, you, you can get more or less stable uh, dynamics. So, so let's just play with this. Let's assume that the sheep can gain lots from food, much more. So then you will have, uh, with the same resources, more sheep. But then as the sheep increase, then there are more wolves. And then the wolves finish the sheep because there were too many, and then they start to death. And um, let's say that's that's collapse. So uh, it, it was it, it seemed to be beneficial for the sheep to get more energy <laughs> from grass. But then that made them very effective. Uh, and once there were too many sheep, then there were too many wolves. And once there were too many wolves, they finished the sheep, and then they all died. Uh, so. It's it's kind of nonlinear feedbacks. So um, if we're interested in sustainability of different systems, I mean, people speak about sustainability of the planet, but also sustainability of fisheries, sustainability of cities, sustainability of economies. Um, basically that they can continue functioning. Um, or if we are interested in, in growth, like how can we grow an economy or production but in a sustainable way, meaning that will not compromise the future of, of an economy or a society or a city, uh, then we need to understand 
all of the concepts that we we have been reviewing, uh, the feedbacks, uh, how to explore all these different parameters of simulations. Uh, so so yeah, it's it's not trivial because in most cases decisions are taken without considering effects such as the slower is faster, and um, and this leads to catastrophes all the time. <laughs> grass always wins. Uh, yeah, I mean, you cannot kill the, the grass because um, it, they just regrow automatically. If, if it was a bit more realistic, in the sense that the grass needs to more grass to be reproduced, then you could finish the grass and then everyone dies. Um, so Amari asked whether this agent-based model is equivalent to the classic local terrace system of differential equations. Uh, yes and no, um, in the sense that you can have the same dynamical regimes, but in the Lotka Volterra uh, model, you have what people call a well-mixed population. Basically that you, you just see how many sheep, how many wolves, uh, and then you compare that. But then you assume that all the wolves can get to all the sheep. And here you can see that, uh, so if we run this simulation again, uh, well, let's just do it. Uh, so the same parameters, uh, and let's just see how many cycles have uh, occurred before everyone goes 16. Well, that's it's just one. So it seems it's not very, oh no. Yeah, the sheep conquered theirs. Well, no, they didn't because let's say the grass is limited now, but let's say they, they stabilize. Um, so in a local Volterra equation, uh, it's deterministic. So you will always get the same result. And in this system, since there are some random movements and there are spatial interactions, uh, so for example, they, they, were, they were the last wolves, they didn't manage to find the few ships that were left, and then the ship survived, the wolves died. If we, if by chance uh, the wolves find the last ship, then the, the ship will become extinct. And of course, th this depends on, on how many, so again, this happened. Oh no, the wolves survived, and now there are lots of wolves, and now they all kill all the ship. So it's a matter of, of luck, uh, and this is given, uh, determined by spatial interactions. Um, and if the spatial structure is a bit more complicated, then you can have even more sophisticated effects uh, that in some region you can have some behavior and in another region you can have different behavior. Uh, yes, so, so then answers uh, in the same direction that it's a discrete version of, uh, of it. And so the, since it's discrete, it's easier to reach zero. In local Volterra equations, since you are working with real numbers, you can have like 0 0.0001 wolves, <laughs> uh, and then they can grow back out of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, but this is not a discretization of the of the Lotka Volterra equations. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's can describe the same phenomena, but it's not the same equations just uh, discretized. And if you see, you can you can speak about this in, ele in elementary school. It's not like, uh, as opposed to local Volterra equations that you need first to take so many courses in calculus. Uh, and then you can say, oh, we have this model of ships and wolves. Uh, and you go to, I don't know, third graders and say, well, we have these ships and walls and they eat each other and, and it's understandable. Um, so that's another advantage of agent based model that you don't need strong mathematical background to, to work with them. So in computational social sciences, this has been a, a big breakthrough because now you can have computational models of complex social phenomena. Uh, and sociologists don't need like very strong mathematical education to, to achieve this. Um, 
yeah, I mean, that's also why many people are arguing that nowadays it's much more, uh, it, it should be much more relevant to teach probability and statistics rather than calculus. Also because calculus doesn't work with um, distributions that don't have a proper mean, uh, uh, well-defined mean. So many phenomena have scale-free distributions or skewed distributions like earthquakes. Um, so, so this means that you have infinite standard deviations and also that the mean is meaningless. <laughs> uh, I mean, we'll, if, if we are interested about studying earthquakes, let's say in Mexico City, uh, the average earthquake intensity doesn't tell us anything or the average frequency of earthquakes doesn't tell us anything. Uh, we're interested about the, the rare, uh, strong earthquakes, the outliers. Um, so calculus doesn't work for that. Yeah. So let me show you some, some other models. Um, well, there's classic model of flocking, which is an example of self-organization. This is inspired by uh, a model which was developed by Craig Reynolds in the 1980s, which he called Boyd's. And this was presented at Seagraph conference and later was uh, used to animate the bats in the bat cave in the first Batman film. So Craig Reynolds got an Oscar for that. Uh, well, he, he's part of the artificial life community. So he, he has been to, to some of the conferences. Uh, and many people have made many sophistications of, of this model, which is very, very simple and illustrates self-organization. So there is no leader uh, void, uh, they just try to, uh, they have a radius. In, in this case, it's five patches. A patch is a, a, a spatial unit. So let me change the color. Yeah. I, I don't know where you can see it, but it's a, it's, more or less the size of one of the voids. So let's say there's a radius of five and uh, in NetLogo you have agents which are called turtles because this is inherited from the original logo developed by, by Seymour Papert in, in MIT, uh, which was used to teach children um, how to program. Actually, when I was six, I learned how to program with logo. Program of the Mexican Academy of Sciences, the Technological Museum. Um, so let's say it's relatively easy to tell a turtle or an agent what to do. Uh, you, you have simple rules. And um, then you have patches in space, and these have Cartesian coordinates. And then uh, you can use patches to interact uh, with. Uh, the turtles and vice versa, or the turtles can interact with their neighbors. So you can say, oh, how many turtles are in this same patch that I am, or in, in the patches with a radius of one or two, in this case, it's five. So basically, um, if we reduce this, then they will, uh, the, the agents will kind of uh, spread out more because they only perceive uh, agents that are closer to them. And if we increase this, then they will kind of gather more because what they do is that they, they try to keep average speed and direction alignment with the agents that are their neighbors. Uh, so if, if we increase the size of the neighborhood, then there will be more uh, agents spotted in there. Depending on how you feel with these parameters, you get behaviors which are, uh, are more similar to flocks of birds or schools of fishes or swarms of insects. Uh, there are many variations, but it's 
here in the in the top you can see interface and then info he, here it explains what the system what the model is doing so uh, it tells you what to do what you can try um, so when you first open a model go to info and read and you will see uh, what it does and what you can do and then the code is relatively simple um, let's let's go back to the to the wolves model because that's easier to, to show what what the code does. So first you have some global variables, uh, maximum number of sheep. So let's say don't let it explode. Uh, and then breed is a type of agent. So you have sheep and wolves. And then uh, all eight, all turtles, either sheep or wolves, have energy. And then uh, the patches have a countdown, which is uh, for the grass to regrow. And then setup is kind of initializes everything, you erase everything. Um, and then this is just the, the maximum number of sheep, depending on whether you are using the web version. Uh, and then if, if you are <coughs> running with the, the model with grass, then um, you, you randomly assign a color, either green or brown, to the patches. If they're green, they have grass. If otherwise, it's brown. Uh, and if the patch color is green, then the countdown will be the grass regrowth time. And if it's brown, then you put a random number that is between zero and grass regrowth time. Uh, and then you ask the patches to, to get green. So the, this is, if this is not the case, basically if, if you don't care about the grass regrowth, then all the patches will be green. And then you um, create a number of sheep, create a number of walls, and then you put the variables for each. Uh, and then when you press go, this is executed. If there are no more turtles, you stop the model. Um, if there are no wolves and there's a maximum number of sheep, then a sheep inherited the earth, and then you stop the simulation. Then you ask all the sheep. So this this makes like all the sheep one by one to execute this code to move. We will see what move does later, uh, and then they, they will reduce their energy. Eat grass if there is grass. We will see there, and then there's a procedure for death, and then the sheep will reproduce at a rate that you, you can change. And similarly for wolves, they move, they reduce energy, they eat, they die, and then they reproduce. And um, just patch to, to grow grass, and we'll see. That, well, all of these are procedures that are explained below. And then tick that makes the the simulation to to advance. So the movement is basically you move to the left, uh, random number between zero and fifty degrees, and to the right the same. Then you move one patch forward. Um, eat grass, this is for sheep only. If you are on a green patch, then change its color and then increase your energy with the amount of energy that sheep gain from food. So I think first it was five, then we increased to 30. That was not good. Uh, then with certain percentage, uh, certain probability, um, Sheep will reproduce. That uh, is basically uh, you put uh, you take a sheep and reduce its energy, and then you create another turtle at that, that same spot. So so it's reproduction more like bacteria. And same for wolves. And then um, this this uh, temporal variable let prey one of the sheep here. So 
a wolf needs to be in the same patch as a sheep. But if there's nobody here, <laughs> if there's no prey, uh, then, sorry, if prey is not nobody, if it's nobody, then you don't do anything. But then you bas basically die, uh, die. You kill <laughs> the sheep and then you increase your energy. Um, if your energy is less than zero, you die. This procedure is to, to regrow the grass. Um, this to repaint the grass, uh, to, to put it in the right color, uh, to display labels, and, and that's it. So it's relatively easy to to modify um, because I mean you have these sliders, and if you want another variable, so for example, we can. Uh, with this speed, let's just put the maximum. And then, hmm, to, to move it, but just a minute. So if I go to the code and in this procedure that the, Agents move, which is this one. Instead of moving them forwards, I'll move them the value of speed. So, if speed is zero, then they won't move and basically there are lots of sheep and then the, the wolves, but then it's kind of very local. Let me increase this slightly. Yes, that's not very interesting. But if they move very slowly, does that change anything? It seems it's something intermediate. You, you also have like strong special effects. I will stop it because it will just get close. Ah, let me, yeah. Now that we have finite grass, then things should change. So yeah, everyone dies <laughs> because they cannot move and they extinguish their resources before new grass grows, they die. If we reduce the grass regrowth time, probably things will change. No, they don't. <laughs> If it's really fast, then they do change. But yeah, it's closer to to the case where, uh, let's see, the grass was infinite. But then, let's say this this was the original speed. And like these original parameters. They're mo the species are more or less able to coexist. Uh, I mean, of course, there are oscillations, but it's difficult for, for one species to go extinct. But then let's increase slowly the speed and see whether that affects something. This means that we are mixing a bit more the population. You can see that the waves start increasing the oscillations start becoming greater. So let's pull it even more so it's like mixing it more. So the, the spatial effects uh, are less relevant, but still you can see that Population seems far from zero, even when it goes down and up a lot. And if we increase even more the speed, it's almost like having random locations because they're, they're moving so much. 
and it seems it doesn't change more the, the behavior. So yeah, I mean, with with NetLogo you can explore lots of different things, uh, and it's fun, uh, and you can make your own variations. Um, So we mentioned Daisy World, um, one of the recent classes. So, so the, this model of self-regulation of, of a planet's atmosphere. So we have white daisies and black daisies. Uh, black daisies, uh, they absorb more energy, so they warm the planet more. Um, why this is the opposite. Um, so here you can play with the albedo of the whites and of the blacks, um, percentage of initial ones. Um, and then there's solar luminosity and albedo of, of the surface of the planet. And um, Then we can play and assume there is a, a planet that is kind of has a cycle that increases its distance to its star and then it's reduced. So there's first high, high luminosity, so uh, then more uh, white daisies prevail because they reflect more the light and then they maintain more or less. Then when it reduces, let's say it would get colder, so the black daisies would be favored. And, and like that, they try to maintain more or less the homeostatic uh, temperature of the, of the planet. But anyway, we can see more, more of these in future classes. We're basically out of time. Are, are there any questions? So for, for next day, you might have seen in, in classrooms that you, you will tell us about your ideas for a final project. Uh, no need to prepare presentation, just uh, Tell us about it verbally. It can be in Spanish if you want. Um, but try to think what can you achieve, let's say, in three months that uh, we have left before, a bit less than three months, let's say 10 weeks. Uh, so so you, you should put on the, um, it's both written and spoken. So written on, on Google Classroom, less than 500 words and spoken here. Uh, so Lucrecia asks, is the ship's movement direction random or does it move towards a green pixel? It, it is, uh, yeah, so, so it's not realistic at all in the sense that the ship don't search for food um, and don't hold together when a wolf. <laughs> Comes. Uh, is it difficult to add a property to the system? Uh, I I don't think it would be difficult to simply the, the for the ship to go to, to go together. But uh, if there's no wolf, then they would benefit from spreading so that they will get more food individually. Yeah, I, I think it's easy. Okay, so I'll see you on Tuesday, and um, I, I, for for the following Tuesday. So next Tuesday is the eighth of March, uh, and then the fifteenth. Probably we will uh, discuss on a, another paper, the, the one I mentioned about Ashby and breaking machines. Um, 
but anyway, I'll put it on in the Google Classroom. But in the meantime, have a, a great weekend. And see you on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thanks.